So, like JD said, um, I'm usually based in uh, Santa Barbara, but I'm here in DC for the year, and uh, it's been a really great experience. Um, and while I'm here, I'm working on this new book project called uh, Rewiring Art, which I started to think about back in 2008. I was actually uh, living in France at the time. I had a fellowship there, and I was working on another book project. And I was at this place where um, academics and artists uh, came and you know, spent time working on different projects and interacted with one another. And I found myself spending more and more time with the artists there. Um, I think in part because I understood how academics did their job. I sort of understood what the methodologies were involved. But I found myself just really, really intrigued with how artists did their work. And that planted a couple seeds which are coming to fruition in the sort of work that, uh, that I'm doing right now. So, aha, uh -huh. wonderful. So there are many examples throughout the 20th century of artists engaging with technology, either directly or in commentary via their work. So we could think about the Italian futurists or the Russian constructivists, for example. But what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes today to talk about the art and technology movement of the 1960s, which was very different. Because here we see artists and engineers engaging with one another directly via sustained, often well-funded, and very formal collaborations. Now, of course, the 1960s were an era of great technological change. We saw sort of the clashing waves of exuberant technological enthusiasm, coupled with great pessimism and ambivalence of, and fears about the growing power of technological systems. And looming over all of this is this rather rotund looking man. Uh, this, of course, is C.P. Snow, who in 1959 wrote a critique, um, which by now has become a very common phrase, almost a cliche that was setting out to uh, examine the differences and the divide between the sciences and the humanities. Now, in his original formulation, Lord Snow was making the argument in a very uh, particular Anglo-centric sort of way, arguing that scientists needed to be given a more central position in British government and society. And he, um, in his original formulation, actually paid very little attention at all to artists or engineers. But the phrase, two cultures, ended up taking on a life of its own, and it came to be seen as a general diagnosis of the gulf between the humanities on one hand and science and scientists on the other. And this two cultures thinking is very central to the framing of the 1960s art and technology movement. A second key frame was the changing world of the professional engineer. Long existing in the shadow of scientists, engineers emerged in the 1960s as a highly visible professional community in their own right. The National Academy of Engineering, for example, was formed in 1964. Yet throughout the 1960s, engineers were insecure in their position, especially as critiques about technology rose in volume. There were calls for more humanized forms of engineering, calls to revamp the education of the next generation of engineers, and the calls for engineers themselves to become more socially engaged. Now, artists of of course, we're also a community of uh, professionals who were experiencing profound change as well throughout the 1960s. See the decline of abstract expressionism, for example, the emergence of more mixed media efforts, the merging of art and theater, a huge boom in media attention as artists became pop culture celebrities. You know, so the image done by Andy Warhol on the cover of Time magazine here. Also seen in the 1960s, the sort of culmination of the shift of the global art capital from Paris to New York City, and finally, the emergence of new patrons for art. For example, the National Endowment for the Arts was started by Lyndon Johnson in 1965. So the art and technology movement of the 1960s arose out of all of these different circumstances, and it aroused a lot of excitement, both in the mainstream press as well as in some quarters of the art and engineering communities. But today, the art and technology movement is largely forgotten. If you were to pick up a basic undergraduate textbook on art history, you would be very hard pressed to find even any mention of it occurring in the 1960s. And what I found was this uh, situation to be very intriguing, because I've always been fascinated by what we can think of as hidden histories, histories that sort of exist in the shadow of other larger narratives, or histories that are camouflaged by other things. So when the art and technology movement is remembered, if it ever is, it's oftentimes seen through the experiences of the artists. And this is in large part because many of the artists who got involved were leading figures of the worlds of art, dance, theater, and experimental music, sort of stars of the American avant-garde art scene, largely centered around New York City, people like the sort of folks that I'm showing you here. 
But the art and technology movement was built on collaboration. And who, I would ask, is going to tell the story of Bob Kuronsky? He was a collaborator with artists. I would be doubtful if anybody in this room has ever heard of him. He was an engineer at Bell Labs. He worked with people like Andy Warhol and Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. But his story is largely lost to history. And one of the things I'm interested in doing is recovering some of this hidden history and bringing it back to light. Now, if there was one engineer who achieved any sort of visibility during the art and technology movement, it would have been Billy Kluver. Billy Kluver was born in Sweden in 1927. He goes on to get his PhD in electrical engineering at Berkeley in 1957. And then he takes a job at Bell Labs, where he becomes a member of the uh, Bell Labs technical staff. Now, the Bell Labs part is really important here. Because as many of you know, although Bell Labs no longer exists, a sad story of corporate mergers and shifting socioeconomic forces, in the 1960s, Bell Labs was the world's preeminent industrial laboratory. And Kluver, working his day job at uh, Murray Hill, where Bell Labs' uh, main laboratory was based, but spending his evenings in lower Manhattan, really literally had a foot in both sides of the two cultures, spending time on one hand with engineers and technicians of Bell Labs, and spending his evenings with jazz music musicians, avant-garde artists, and other people in the New York art scene. Kluver himself, identified by Life Magazine, the uh, hard to live up to title is the Edison, Tesla, Steinmetz, Marconi, Leonardo da Vinci of the American avant-garde. It's quite a mouthful begins to collaborate with artists sort of on an individual basis around 1960. So he begins to work with people like Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. But about five or six years later, Kluver and a group of New York artists organized a highly publicized art and technology event called Nine Evenings Theater and Engineering. Engineers and technicians at Bell Labs contributed thousands of hours of unpaid labor to the event. International publicity resulted from it. Um, some of it positive, most of it not. Most of the critics' reactions to it was um, indeed quite negative, and we could talk about that a little bit in the Q&A if you want. But what emerged out of Nine Evenings was a nonprofit organization that Kluver uh, co-founded and then led for several years called Experiments in Art and Technology. Now, EAT, as it was known, was a complex organization with many goals. One of them was to serve as a matchmaker of sorts to connect the communities of professional artists with professional engineers, to find partnerships to help people connect uh, in much of the same way as we've heard some of uh, that coming from people stepping up to the microphone today, looking for an expert in microphotography, for example. Um, EAT also wanted to act as a broker between artists and industry. And finally, EAT was interested in launching very ambitious art and science and art and technology uh, projects. And by the late 1960s, experiments in art and technology had become the most visible and most prominent of the art and technology organizations. Now, for those of you who know something about the history of science, you might think about the 1960s as the era of classic big science. By this, I mean large-scale and expensive efforts in research. Think of the Apollo moon missions or the building of large-scale particle accelerators. And I would argue that there was an artistic analog to this big science, something that EAT was instrumental in. For several years, starting around 1967, EAT was involved with the Pepsi Corporation in conjunction with the uh, World's Fair that was held in Osaka, Japan in 1970. Uh, in 1968, Pepsi hired EAT to oversee the construction of an ambitious multimedia environment for the company's pavilion at Expo 70. And scores of American and Japanese engineers, artists, and industrial contractors helped make the Pepsi pavilion. And the cost approaching something um, in today's money of around $12 million. So one can make the argument, I would think, that for the time, this was one of the world's most expensive art projects. Again, sort of the analog to the big science projects of the day. Here's an image, a little bit hard to decipher, of the pavilion seen at the daytime. It's shrouded in a fog sculpture that was made by a Japanese artist, Fujiko Nakaya, and an American physicist by the name of Thomas Mee. And if you were visiting Expo 70 and you waited in line and you made your way inside, you might see something like this. One of the dramatic features of the pavilion was this 90-foot diameter spherical mirror that functioned as the ceiling of the pavilion that created illusions of people and things floating in space. And um, it was also the place where performers uh, carry on um, 
uh, visual demonstrations like that shown here. But the result was that the pavilion became an innovative and immersive audio and visual environment that millions of visitors to Expo 70 experienced. But creating the Pepsi Pavilion pushed EAT's resources and organization past its breaking point. And by the time Expo 70 was being dismantled, EAT was fading in prominence. In fact, after barely a decade of highly visible and expensive efforts, the art and technology movement in the United States went into hibernation. Artists and art critics alike judged these interdisciplinary collaborations as a disappointment, if not an outright disaster. Critics claimed that artists had compromised themselves aesthetically by not producing better art, as well as ethically by getting in bed with corporations, research labs, and engineers. As one incensed observer wrote in Art Forum, artists had been abetted by their engineer collaborators and had become nothing than would-be magi, con men, fledgling technocrats, acting out mad science fiction fantasies while freeloading at a trough of techno-fascism. <laughs> Clearly, that art critic had something else in mind that he was also critiquing there besides just art and technology collaborations. But by the mid-1970s, the art and technology movement appeared as out of fashion as moon landings and other techno-utopian projects launched in the mid-1960s. But it's that brief um, flowering of this art and science, art and technology collaborations done in these formal efforts that I'm interested in writing about in this new book project. And Obviously, art and technology collaborations didn't end after groups like EAT faded away in the early 1970s. Billy Kluver, in fact, said that EAT wasn't supposed to be a permanent fixture for the art and technology scene. He imagined that other organizations would take up his mission. And I think this has happened. There's a proliferation of university centers emerging starting in the late 1960s that have promoted art and technology and art and science collaborations. I see this, for example, in my own university. The University of California has more than half a dozen art and technology centers and programs among its 10 campuses. And globally, the last time I looked, there were something like 50 or 60 similar programs at universities in Europe and the United States, as well as artists in residence programs at companies and national labs. And it would be hard to write about the art and technology movement and thinking about it in the present sense without noticing calls today for STEM education to incorporate the arts, the STEM to STEAM movement, which I believe Tom will talk about in a few seconds. So one of the points I'd like to leave you with is that history can help us discover a usable past. And what I see is that interest in art and engineering seems to come in waves. It seems to coincide with ideas that engineering education needs to be rethought and perhaps redesigned, and that engineers need some form of humanizing. This history shows us that art and technology and engineering, however, are not static categories. They are products very much of their time. So any art and technology efforts in the mid 21st century are going to look very different from those in the mid 1960s. But ultimately, this is about how engineers and artists in the past as well as in the future, express and defend their creativity. One way they did this was by rewiring art. And one outcome of this, both then as well as in the future, is a new creative culture. Thank you very much. Bye.